Uh, so this talk is uh, sponsored by Brain Lab. Here are my disclosures. I do get an honorary from Brain Lab for this talk. So uh, in essence, you know, we've had several talks, you know, already about the error rate of, of freehanding stuff. Um, initially, we started doing um, the Aero CT and navigation with Brain Lab at UCSF a few years back. The Aero CT um, is a little bit bulky. You can't really move it from room to room. And uh, you need a CT tech to come operate this thing. So uh, we've gone to trying other systems, and, and I'll show you the loopback system in just a little bit. What I'm going to do is I show it to you in a, in a, in a couple of cases that, uh, that I've been using it on. So this is a, a patient who um, had a prior SI joint fusion, has a scoliosis, uh, and she's got a foot drop, a lot of low back pain, and uh, a lot of stenosis, two to one. So here's her long cassette x-rays. You can see her prior SI joint fusion. She's still got the, uh, she's got the scoli that's never been operated on, bit of a flat back there. Her uh, LLPI uh, is, is not where we want it to be. She's gonna need some lordosis and she's gonna need a multi-level construct here, which we like to do these MIS at, at UCSF. So um, the first thing that we did was uh, because she needed 34 degrees of LLPI correction, we did um, a lift and then we did a lateral with an anterior longitudinal ligament release. Uh, and um, so after that, we got the lordosis correction, uh, and then we um, used, uh, this is the original uh, system that I used with Brain Lab, uh, the navigation system, which intraoperatively, it sets up at the foot of the bed. You can see the setup here, the scrub tech to my right. Um, you can see all the navigated instruments there on the, on the uh, stand. And uh, the nice thing with the Brain Lab is that you can use the pointer and you can use an instrument uh, simultaneously on opposite sides of the field. So you can point at one pedicle, start planning that trajectory while you're drilling the other side simultaneously. And then this little sw swivel screen swings around and you can do an intraoperative CT and basically check that everything's good before you leave the field. Uh, and so that's always helpful. And especially with MIS screws, because you don't see where these things are going. Um, you want to make sure that these things are good. And um, you, know, you can line up uh, in a Scully case to get perfectly neutral with each screw so that you make sure that you're looking down a screw shaft and, and that, that all these screws are in good position. You can also pull up the MRI on the brain lab uh, and put it on that same screen so you don't have to keep looking backwards and forwards on a monitor on the wall. So, um, you know, we did that for this case and, um, you know, basically we're able to do it without a lot of blood loss. So here you see the lateral plus the ACR plus the ellipse plus the perk screws. Uh, and, uh, and the brain lab system, if you use the arrow CT, can do all that in one spin. So, um, you know, there's a lot of time savings if you do that. Uh, so that's the system that we have been using for quite a while, but that's not the latest update from Brain Lab. Uh, Brain Lab has um, now developed intraoperative CT navigation robotic platforms. Um, and basically, it looks like this now. It's a LoopX, uh, which is a cone beam CT. Uh, it merges with the uh, robot, which is called the CERC. And the CERC has an active and a passive type of uh, um, robotic system that you can choose. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and, uh, and also, it's integrated navigation. And what you can see from the robotic footprint here is the robot here is really quite small, as opposed to some of the other robots that are out there, which have a huge, big platform that sit on the floor. Uh, this robot attaches to the bed. Uh, the uh, loop X comes in and out of the field. That's actually robotic as well. And you can call the loop X in and out of the field uh, as well. Uh, and I'll show you that in some videos in just a moment here. So fairly small footprint for those of you who have small footprint ORs like we have in San Francisco, we don't have very big ORs. The CERC uh, is a robot which um, can be passive or active. Um, and what happens with the passive is you manually put it into the trajectory that you want for your screw. It locks into place. And then you don't have to do screw planning. You can basically screw plan on the fly here. I'll show you that in a video. You can also do active uh, robotics here, where basically you get it into the ballpark. And then what happens is the robot will do the fine adjustment and line up the screw. Um, the Brain Lab software can automatically do the screw planning for you. You can adjust it on the fly. So you're not sitting there the night before having to plan all these real trajectories. And I don't really have time to sit there the night before and start planning trajectories. I, I'd look at it basically in the room. So it saves me time. And the same robotic arm can be used for those of you who are neurosurgeons for cranial things like LIT and SEEG. And so, um, you know, it doesn't just have spine applications. And that's important for us since we have a, you know, combined cranial spinal service. Uh, so let's let's take a look at this. Uh, with this is the active robot here. I've got a little video uh, from a cadaver lab that I did. 
Um, and basically what you do is you get the robot into the ballpark of where it needs to be. Um, and so once you get into the ballpark, you let it go. The robot does its fine adjustments and locks itself into place. This is really useful for rotated scoliosis cases, especially if I'm training residents, because um, they don't understand that, you know, you have to really cant the robot if you have, you know, like one of these Nashmo really rotated um, vertebral body levels. Uh, and so you basically, it lines it up for you. And then um, you take the, uh, the navigated drill guide. Um, here, I'm just putting it a little bit into the bone so it doesn't move. Uh, you get these big, you know, rounded facets and the, the uh, little robotic arm can slide off. So by sort of hitting it into place, you, you secure the position. And then you basically can uh, drill your trajectory and drop in your K wire. So, um, and you can see that we can do a lot of the software planning as we're going. Um, and the, uh, the the brain lab tech, technician there, who's Eric, who works with me a lot, um, you know, basically is helping me with all this kind of stuff. He's obviously not scrubbed in on a real case, but he's standing there next to the thing. And then we go ahead and just drop the screw in. So fairly quick and accurate. So here's a here's another case where we use that kind of a system. Uh, this is a patient with a pars fracture who also has a scoliosis. Now all her symptoms are just coming from the pars fracture, so I didn't bother fixing all the rest of her scoli. Um, and so uh, the reason I wanted to show this case, I use the CERC passive on this one. Um, so um, you know, basically I'm I'm trying to uh, put the uh, screw trajectory where I want it. And uh, the the nuance here is that you know some people have a narrow pelvic inlet and some people have a really wide pelvic inlet. And for S1, sometimes the pelvis forces you into a more straightforward trajectory, in which case you will need to use a shorter screw because you're not triangulating from lateral to medial because the pelvis is pushing you straight. And the robotics and the, uh, and the navigation really help show you those kinds of nuances. You can try to see that, what, you, what you're going to get basically before you start doing it, um, rather than trying to put a screw that's too long into a more straight trajectory just because the pelvis is forcing you uh, to do that. So, um, you know, the, basically we, we do all the same steps I was showing you in the cadaver lab. We put in the uh, drill guide, we drill, we put in the screw, uh, and uh, we can see, you know, on the, on the screen there uh, as we're doing that. So, um, you know, the, you can see the uh, S1 screws here are not as medialized as the L5 screws, and the reason for that is the pelvic inlet blocked us. So I put in a little bit of a shorter screw. The end construct was, was fine, but those are the kinds of things you have to check with on robotics. And the other thing you have to check with is that when you have an isthmic lysis like this, if you really put a lot of downward pressure, you can shift the spine one way or another, and then you get one screw that's too medial and one screw that's too lateral. So you really got to be careful on the isthmic lysis cases because the L5 and the S1 are completely disconnected. Uh, and so what happens is that the S1 is uh, near to your, near to your, um, um, to your uh, navigation arc because that's connected to the pelvis and which is connected to the S1 through the sacroiliac joints. But L5, because the pars is broken, can independently move side to side from your um, uh, from your navigation arc. So you got to really be careful that you don't push hard and push one side too lateral and one side too medial for the L5 screw. Just a little nuances for those of you who haven't done these on, on instrument cases. These are things that I learned, um, you know, sort of along the way. Um, it is helpful to, uh, to use these robots when you have uh, deformity cases. And it's also helpful to use the loopbacks to check post screw positions positioning. Um, this is the last case I'll show you. This is a 55-year-old who um, had an ALIF in the past and has psoriasis and, and not a really terrible BMI, but one of 32. And the patient has uh, left uh, ankle dorsiflexion weakness uh, and um, has radiculopathies. And you can see it has had a one-level fusion in the past. She has this deformity. Um, you can see all the parameters there. We have an EOS machine, so that, you know, sort of helps us to measure all the stuff beforehand. Uh, and so she's going to need, you know, a little bit of of correction of her LLPI, not much. And her, her SVA is actually pretty good, but what's happening, she gets a lot of up-down frame stenosis, especially on the concavity of that curve. So um, what do we do for this lady? Well, um, you know, we did uh, do some laterals and then we did start putting the screws in from the back. And so we did uh, an A-lift down at the bottom, uh, lateral two, three, and three, four. We did all this in a single position. And then we uh, flipped her prone to do an L1 to S1 posterior MIS. And uh, we used here the, um, Brain Lab Loop X and the uh, Brain Lab Loop X, Loop X is a is a robotics um, you know a CBCT and you can call it in and out of the field. So what happens with this uh, with this machine uh, is basically uh, a couple of different things. One, uh, the robot can be called in and out of the field by the radiation tech using a little tablet. So there's not like a big you know station that you got to manipulate. The uh, robot can also be called in and out of the field by the surgeon with a foot pedal and a pointer. 
Uh, the source detector moves independently. Uh, the source and the detector move independently from each other. So there's no need to be in the ISO center of the, of the X-ray. Um, you can do 2D and 3D imaging, and you can scan from as little area as three by three up to as large an area as four feet by two feet. And I think some of the future ones that Brain Lab is making, you can scan even more. So you can try to get you know, a long cassette X-ray basically on the table. So you can see how quick that is. It moves in and out, it moves up and down. It's all robotically controlled, uh, super easy to use. Um, and so, um, you know, once we do that, then, um, you know, we can acquire the image. It comes right up on the on there. There's no pre-planning associated since I'm using a, a passive on this one. Uh, and even if I did use the active, the pre-planning can be done on the fly. So there's no pre-planning the night before the screw trajectories. And essentially, because the spine is rotated, this is super good for uh, residents who are learning on a scoliosis case, um, how medial they have to be on, on one side and how laterally oriented their, uh, their trajectories have to be on the other side to account for the rotation of the scoliosis. And it keeps them from you know, doing violations into the pedicle and from slipping off the facet joint and putting screws into places that they, that they shouldn't be. So super helpful tool in terms of, uh, of teaching for those of you who have uh, residents. And, and you know, once you get used to uh, the, the workflow and, and our, uh, our tech for Brain Lab, Eric, who's, who's here again in the background, is uh, really good with these things, you know, it becomes actually really quick. Uh, and you can see, you know, this is real time and just the, the screw is drilled, the K wire is down, I'm ready to put the screw in, you know, basically no futz and, um, you know, we move on to the next level. And putting the screws in is like, you know, the fastest part of the case here in a rotational scoliosis. And it used to be, you know, in an open case with no nav, it was a struggle that we all had. And then were you too medial, you too lateral, have you accounted for the rotation, all these other things that we had to worry about, which we don't have to worry about all those things now. I do bob the K wire up and down as demonstrated here to keep sure that the, the K wire and, and the screw trajectory are, are staying the same and I'm not bending that K-wire and forcing it through the front and, and you know, causing bad problems with K-wire migration. And then um, you know, we just drop the screw in. You know, there's all kinds of screw systems now that you don't even have to use a tap. We just go straight to screw saving steps and then you know, that screw's done and you go to the next one. And the, the beauty of Brain Lab, which I didn't show in this video, is while this screw is going down, you can use a pointer to point at the contralateral side simultaneously at the same level. So you're basically planning the other side while you're putting this screw down just to save time. And then we check, you know, before we leave the OR with the loop XCT, uh, call it into the field, take a shot, make sure everything's good so that you have everything, um, you know, basically checked out before you before you split. And then, you know, we ended up with this construct on this patient. So I think um, robotics and navigation is not fail safe. You still, as a surgeon, you have to pay attention to things like narrow pelvic inlets to things like, you know, pars fractures where the L5 uh, may slide around lateral to medial because it's not connected to S1, and S1 is where, you know, connected to the pelvis where your frame is. You always want to navigate for these distal to the frame, towards the frame. So if you have your frame down the pelvis and you're, you're starting a screw at L1, you go from L1 down towards S1. Don't go from S1 up to L1 because you, you're increasing the inaccuracy potentially by the end of the case. Um, double check the accuracy, and I like to do a spin before I leave the room. I call the robotic loop X machine into the into the field, and we do a quick spin and check everything out. Uh, and it's been super helpful in my practice. And I'm hopeful that um, you know if any of you have any questions about this that you ask me or or any of the, the team from Brain Lab. Thanks so much. Yep. Praveen, Pat Johnson, hey, thank you very much for just giving us a great overview of uh, how you do these things. And we're getting a little perspective just about every different technology here. And this is a great one. And really appreciate your participation in this. Thanks. Thanks so much, Pat. Hey, uh, Praveen, it's Martin Pham here. Um, you know, the, the ability to move around that arm um, I think it, it's really under, it seems underestimated. You know, I think that the first few systems, with the, the Globus and, and the Medtronic where the, the arm itself moves is you know, compelling to kind of see it move, but the ability to have a um, semi-rigid, both passive and active arm, have you seen um, a benefit with that? Because now you, you sort of have the benefit of, of both, right? Freehand navigation, which you can bring something close to the field, and then you, you can just have the, the robot have its minor adjustments. Have, have you seen that? Yeah, we, we've used both. Um, we're facile with both. 
Uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, it depends on what your hospital is able to afford. I think that's part of it. Um, for us, because we have cranial applications and spine applications, you know, our hospital tends to um, tends to try to get things that we can use applications for both on. So uh, I think some of it depends on what, what funding sources you have and what you can get. They both work really well. I've used both and I enjoy both of them. And then when you when you marry it with a LoopX, with the robotic, uh, you know, scanner that comes in and out, it really is like a next generation system and makes your life quite a bit easier. And, and your residents really will get this, the junior residents. They're all growing up now playing video games and, and watching things in in, in uh, virtual reality. So they, they don't really have a leap to understand what's going on here. Um, whereas, you know, old fogies like me had to have a little bit of a learning curve. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great, great contribution.